Suppose we have a set S which consists of the integers 1 through 9. And we define an equivalence relation, let x be equivalent to y, if and only if x minus y is divisible by 3 for any elements x and y in the set S. And now let's look at the element 1. And we can ask which things in the set are equivalent to 1 using this definition for the equivalence relation. So let's see, we have 1 and what else? Uh, how about 2? 1 minus 2 is negative 1. That's not divisible by 3. How about 3? 1 minus 3, that's negative 2. That's not divisible by 3. How about 4? 1 minus 4, that's negative 3. That is divisible by 3. So 4 would be equivalent to 1. See anything else? Uh, how about 5? 1 minus 5, that's not going to work. 1 minus 6 isn't going to work. 1 minus 7, well that's negative 6. That's divisible by 3. How about 8? 1 minus 8, that's not divisible by 3. And 1 minus 9, that's not divisible by 3. So I think this is it. These are the things in the set S that uh, are equivalent to 1. 1 is equivalent to itself, and 4 and 7. Okay, uh, so we took care of the 1, we took care of the 4, and we took care of the 7. How about 2? What's equivalent to 2? Uh, 3, 2 minus 3, no, that's not divisible by 3. How about 5? 2 minus 5, that works. And how about 6, no, and 8? Eight? 8 works and nine doesn't work. Okay, so we've got two, five, and eight, and I think the last three, three, six, and nine, will all be equivalent to each other. And so uh, these groupings here that we have, we call these equivalence classes. These are the things that are equivalent to each other. And there's some notation that we can use to represent an equivalence class. So these are examples here of the equivalence classes for the relation that I defined above. And if I wanted to uh, refer to an equivalence class, what I can do is select any element from the class and put some square brackets around it, like this. So this would mean the equivalence class of things that are equivalent to 1. And this is also the same thing. I could have written it like this with the 4 or with the 7. It doesn't matter because they're all equivalent to each other. You just pick one element from the equivalence class as a representative. And then I could also say the same thing for the other uh, two equivalence classes. So in general, if we have an equivalence relation defined on a non-empty set S, then if x is an element of s, then the equivalence class of x is denoted by x with the square brackets, where it's the set of elements in s that are equivalent to x. So using this idea of equivalence classes, we can prove a few properties related to equivalence classes. So here's an example. Let uh, tilde be an equivalence relation defined on a set S, and let X be an element of S. Then we can show that X belongs to the equivalence class of X. This seems kind of obvious, but we'll go ahead and prove it anyways. And just to remind you, here are the three properties of equivalence relations, reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And here's an example that we used before the set S of uh, integers 1 through 9 and the three equivalence classes. Okay. So I want to show that x belongs to its own equivalence class. Well, the definition of equivalence classes is that um, x will be in the uh, equivalence class if it's equivalent to itself. That's just the reflexive property. So by the reflexive property, x is equivalent to x, and this means that x belongs to the equivalence class of x. Okay, that was an easy one. Let's do a harder one. How about, let tilde be an equivalence relation defined on a set S with X and Y being elements of S, and let X be an element of the equivalence class of Y. Then we want to show 
that the equivalence class of x equals the equivalence class of y. Now, these are two sets, and we're trying to show that they're equal to each other. So if we have x being uh, an element of the equivalence class of y, then by the definition of equivalence classes, that means x is equivalent to y. And to show that these two sets are equal, there's a general method. Whenever you have two sets that you want to show are equal, you always want to show that one is a subset of the other and then do the reverse, that the other one is a subset of the first one. So here's what I mean. First show that the equivalence class of x is a subset of the equivalence class of y, and then we're going to do it the other way around later. So first let's do this. Okay. Uh, well, let's let A be an element of the equivalence class of X. And what we want to show then is that A is also an element of the equivalence class of Y. That would mean that the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y. Well, by the definition of equivalence classes, that means that A is equivalent to X. And we also know by the transitive property that A is equivalent to Y. Now, why is that? So we said that a is equivalent to x, okay, so we know that. And then we also know from up here, x is equivalent to y. And so using those two together, we can say that A is equivalent to y by the transitive property. Okay, so then we can say that A is an element of the equivalence class of y, and therefore the equivalence class of x is a subset of the equivalence class of y. Great. Let's do it the other way around now. Show that the equivalence class of y is a subset of the equivalence class of x. So we're going to use the same idea here. We're going to let, this time I'll say b, be an element of the equivalence class of y, so that b is equivalent to y. By symmetry, y is equivalent to x, and then by transitivity, b is equivalent to x. Now why did I need to use symmetry this time? So I have b is equivalent to y, so let's write that down. And then I have, up from up here, x is equivalent to y. But if I want to use transitivity, eh, they're in the wrong order here. So if I switch this one, so um, or the second one here, if I switch the second one so that it becomes y is equivalent to x, then I can use these two together with transitivity to give me b is equivalent to x. And so B is an element of the equivalence class of X. Then the equivalence class of Y is a subset of the equivalence class of X. And because I've shown that they're subsets of each other, these sets must be equal. Okay, let's try another one. Let tilde be an equivalence relation defined on a set S, and let X and Y be elements of X. Then X is equivalent to Y if and only if the equivalence class of x equals the equivalence class of y. So this time we have an if and only if that we have to prove. Now remember when you have an if and only if, you have to show both directions. We have to go this way and we have to go that way. So let's show this direction first. So that means we're going to suppose x is equivalent to y and we're going to show that the uh, equivalence classes of x and y are equal. So suppose x is equivalent to y. What does that mean? That means that x is an element of the equivalence class of y. But if x is an element of the equivalence class of y, then the equivalence class of x equals the equivalence class of y. That's what we just showed in uh, the previous proof. So we've shown one direction. Now we have to show the other direction. Now we're going to show that if these equivalence classes are equal, then x is equivalent to y. Okay, suppose that the equivalence classes are equal, but y is an element of the equivalence class of y. That was the first thing we proved. So y must also be an element of the equivalence class of x. Then y is equivalent to x, and by symmetry, x is equivalent to y. Let's look at one more proof. Let tilde be an equivalence relation defined on a set S, and let X and Y be elements of S. Then either the equivalence classes of X and Y are equal, or the intersection is the empty set. So when we have an either-or situation here, uh, what we can do is 
assume that one of the two options is not true and show that the other one then has to be true. In other words, let's start by saying that the intersection of the equivalence classes of x and y is not equal to the empty set. Our goal then will be to show that it must be the case that the equivalence classes are equal. Okay, so if they're not equal to the empty set, then there must be some element, I'll call it A, that's in both the equivalence class of x and the equivalence class of y. has to be true. Well, if that's the case, then the equivalence class of A equals the equivalence class of x, and the equivalence class of A also equals the equivalence class of y. That's something that we proved earlier. But if that's true, then the equivalence classes must be equal. Since we assumed that one of the things here was not true and then showed that it was the case that the other one had to be true, then we've proved what we need to prove here.